The best soldiers in the world are the ones who know what they're fighting for. And to make our soldiers the best informed in the world, the War Department has been presenting discussions before our troops at Army posts all over the country. Each Thursday at this time, for some weeks past, the Columbia Network has broadcast one of these talks from some Army posts. In the past weeks, you have heard Edward R. Murrow, William L. Shirer, Lee White, Quentin Reynolds, and Herbert Agar. Tonight, we bring you the concluding program of this series, What Are We Fighting For?, from Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. Here, 15,000 officers and men are assembled to hear a distinguished soldier of the First World War. To introduce him, we present the commander of the 82nd Division, Major General O.N. Bradley. General Bradley. On October 8, 1918, Sergeant Alvin C. York, a member of the 82nd American Division, captured almost single-handed 132 German officers and men. For this feat, he was designated as the outstanding soldier of the AEF. The 82nd Division, known then and now as the All-American Division, has been reactivated and is now assembled on a hillside here at Camp Flavor, Louisiana. Every present member of the division hopes to emulate the example set by Sergeant York. Today, the War Department announced the appointment of Sergeant York as a major in the Army of the United States. <laughs> Men of the 82nd Division, here is your Sergeant York. Thank you, General Bradley. I'm mighty proud to be here with my old division, the 82nd, even if it's only for a business. The old 82nd was mustered out after the last war, but in the hearts of the men who served with it over there, the All-American Division never was and never could be mustered out. I'll never forget my first day with the old outfit at Camp North, Georgia. It was in November 1917. They put me in the 21st training battalion, and it seemed like they had a job for me right off. They told me they were going to put me on the police. I thought that's not so bad for an old mountain boy, getting on the police the first crack out of the bus. So the rest of the day, I went around camp doing police work. Yes, sir. Policing. Policing for scraps of paper and cigarette butts. Seriously, though, being here with the 82nd again is a peculiar feeling. It's like living something all over. Here you boys are training to finish the job we thought we had done for all time. The job of keeping our country's freedom from going under the heel of the dictator. Last time after the Germans hung out the white rag and we sailed home, we thought there'd never be another war. We those boys didn't realize then, and some of the men in the higher places didn't realize that freedom is not a thing you can win once and for all. We never owned freedom. We only got a lease on it. A payment came due in 17 and 18. Now another one is due. But this time we're going to make such a big payment that it'll be a many of a year before another one is demanded of us. <laughs> the Germans have always underestimated us Americans. I remember one day back in the Argonne, when we took several prisoners, I noticed one German corporal looking us over, my the club. He could speak a little English. He asked if all of us in the outfit were Americans. We told him we were. He just shook his head. Didn't seem that he could take it at all. You see, the All-American Division was made up of boys from all over the country. There, there were boys from uh, the mountains like me and boys from the small towns and cities. 
There were Southerners, New Yorkers, Middle Westerners, as well as boys from the cow country in the Pacific Coast. And there were men whose folks had been Greek, Italian, Jewish, German, Polish, Swedish, and Irish. Just every strain of good American you could think of. It sure seemed to get this German corporal down. He just couldn't understand how we could all pull together and smash up soldiers of the great German race. Today, the Germans and the Japs, that goes for the Japs too, they can't get it through their thick heads that it's not your creed or your heart, not the color of your eyes that makes an American. It's our freedom and equality over the Constitution and our Bill of Rights that makes an American an almighty fighter. Once a man has tasted that freedom, he'd rather die fighting than to do without it for himself and his children. I've never doubted for one minute who's going to win this war. Already, we're over the house. Like General Marshall said the other day, the time for action is near. The Germans say, oh, you fellas can't fight a modern war. You've got too much of that freedom and democracy stuff to win a modern war. Boys, I don't have to tell you what a big lie that is. It's because of his freedom and democracy that the American soldier has never and will never lose any war. The American soldier doesn't need any of the false morale that comes from a dying of something like He knows what he's fighting for, and he knows and can stand to know that the enemy is tough, well trained, well equipped. You don't have to tell him that the other fellow is a coward to make him fight. What's more, he can take it as well as dish it out. The American fighting man is like... Like they made a little mistake. 
they come back lying too. When our Navy and you boys really get a whack at those Japs and Germans, and when those fellas really learn what it means to pick a scrap with, them, with the American Eagle, well, boys, it's going to be too bad. When it's time to fight, America doesn't fiddle around. They finish it up so they can get back to that pretty girl who's waiting for them at home. Back in 1918, we first, when we first got to France, we were broke up in replacement for the French army. A bunch of us boys in the 82nd Division were sent to the Boys Mountains to help a French outfit. When we got there, the French officer in charge gave us a little lecture. None of us could party boo, but we just said okay to everything he said. Next morning, the Germans came over. We let go with our train fields and automatic, and I tell you, we really dusted their britches. And they turned out for home. Meanwhile, there wasn't a Frenchman in sight. They all retreated. Pretty soon the French officer came back. He was stopping man. We couldn't understand what he said this time any more than we had before. About that time, an American liaison officer happened along. He told us what the French officer was so stirred up about. And it seems that in this sector, the uh, French officer had an understanding with the Germans. One day he let the Germans take his front line trenches. And the next day, the Germans will let his outfit take them back. That didn't suit our book at all. The American officer told that Frank fella that we'd come here to fight. Instead of he didn't want us disturbing the peace in his part of the war, he'd better get rid of it. That's exactly what happened. That Frenchman had us transferred back to the All-American Division. Back to the American forces, after that, General Pershing got all the Americans together and broke the Hindenburg Line. People say to me, Sergeant, how do you think these boys of 42 compare with those fellas who fought the last war? Now, I want to say to you boys of the 82nd Division, and I tell the people who ask me that, I won't say you're a better natural born trapper than your fathers were. Americans have always been good fighters when they need me. But you boys are better trained and equipped. You are smarter and no more than any American army of our history. I am confident. The American people are confident that you will do a better job than we did last time. Today, the threat to our American freedom is greater than this country has ever known. And I'll guarantee that the licking up the sound boys will give those fellas is going to be bigger than the threat. Sergeant Alvin Seagor, former soldier in the First World War, at the Hood Stevens Officers of the of his old division, the 82nd at Camp Faber, Louisiana, and the sixth and last of a series of broadcasts, designed to keep our soldiers the best informed in the world. The series has been presented by the War Department and the Columbia Network to troops both at home and overseas, and returns to the facilities of WWL in New Orleans. Mike Clark speaking, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System.